it's Father's Day today. As difficult as it may be to envision, fathers were once young boys themselves. And if they grew up in the mid-1950s, there's a good chance that at one time or another, they wore a genuine Davy Crockett coonskin cap. The furry hat with a striped raccoon tail in the back was all the rage back then, thanks to Walt Disney, who produced television shows lionizing the early 19th century frontiersmen and legend. The theme song was highly memorable, even if filled with lots of inaccuracies. He wasn't really born on a mountaintop, but in a valley. And it's doubtful he killed a bear when he was only three years old. But the show spurred the imagination of countless youngsters and created a demand for Davy's signature coonskin cap. In real life, Crockett claimed he could get a raccoon to fall out of a tree just by grinning at it. In the TV series, one memorable episode included Davy ruminating on the possibility of doing the same thing to a black bear. Crockett was a renowned bear hunter, but there's no record of the man actually grinning a bear to death. That's just a bit of Disney storytelling magic. A well-known figure from the Bible also had a history of battling with bears and lions. The job of a shepherd was not an easy one when young David was tasked with protecting his father's flocks. Not only did he have to worry about the lambs wandering off on their own, but also the occasional attacks by predators like bears and lions. In our Old Testament reading for today, the young shepherd puts his skills to the test, not with one of those two beasts, but against a real beast of a man. But David doesn't face Goliath alone. We'll talk more about facing Goliath later on in today's worship service. So get your slingshot ready. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Hello and welcome to the online worship service of Robinson Memorial Presbyterian Church in Gastonia, North Carolina for Sunday, June 20th, 2021. For the last several years, either on Christmas Day or the Sunday before Christmas, we held a special Love Feast worship service featuring cookies baked right here at the church and decorated with colorful icing by volunteers. Well, with COVID-19, we didn't get to do that in 2020. Last Sunday, during the announcements part of our live worship service, our cookie master, Silva, announced that we are going to make up for the lack of Christmas cookies by baking and decorating the treats for the 4th of July, which happens to fall on a Sunday this year. So, on the 2nd of July, she'll be baking and invites everyone to help decorate that Friday. At its meeting last week, the session decided, well, we'd make lemonade to serve with the cookies, invite everyone to dress casually that day, even in shorts and flip-flops if you want, and conduct our worship service here in Fellowship Hall instead of upstairs in the sanctuary. Now, I want to clarify this is not a love feast like we've done at Christmas, but I'm betting the cookies are going to taste 
just as good. Check back with us for more details as we approach the big day. July kicks off a new quarter, so we'll soon have available the latest edition of these days devotional booklets. We'll have them at the church on Sundays to pick up, and for those whom we know are not able to come to us, we plan to mail a copy to you. If you need us to mail you a copy, let us know. Remember, supplies are limited. Also remember you can join us live and in person for worship at 11 a.m. Sundays with our online version available as of noon Sundays. However you worship with us, we are grateful that you are with us. Now, how about we start this service with our responsive call to worship? Those who know your name put their trust in you, O Lord. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. We will declare your wonderful deeds among all the people. Let us worship God. With God on our side, we feel protected from the storms of life. Our opening hymn for today is, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Ashley provides the music. Your screen will have the lyrics. You provide the singing.
remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weaknesses, since in every respect, he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. They can be such giants in our lives, God of grace. Each day, our fears, our doubts, our worries wash over us until we come to believe that you do not care for us. There seems to be so much wrong in the world. We are convinced that there is nothing good we can do. The storms of sin and temptation batter at us, and we cower, unable to find the faith to withstand them. Forgive us, God of hope. Remind us that if we but open our hearts, you will heal us. If we but listen to your words, we will hear peace and joy. If we but open our lives to you, we can go forth to serve our sisters and brothers, even as we have been served by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. With calming words, with a peaceful spirit, with overflowing love and hope, our God forgives us and fills us with faith. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Our gospel reading for today comes to us from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Listen now to the word of our Lord. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Our Old Testament reading for today comes from 1 Samuel. 
We'll be reading from chapter 17, starting with verse 1a, skipping ahead to 4 through 11, and then verses 32 through 49. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soka in Judah. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield-bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in a pouch of his shepherd's bag, and, with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield-bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, 
and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Caught me doing some measurements here in our sanctuary. What I discovered is that Robert Wadlow of Alton, Illinois, if he had ever walked into our sanctuary, well, he couldn't have stood up straight. You see, Wadlow remains to this day the tallest known human in recorded history. He was 8 foot 11 inches tall. His extreme height was the result of a medical condition. By the time he was in kindergarten, he was already wearing clothes sized for the average 17-year-old. He was reportedly very strong, but had to wear leg braces for most all of his 22 years. He died of an infection caused by an ill-fitting brace in 1940. According to our Old Testament reading for today, Goliath, at six cubits and a span, would have been nearly a foot taller than Mr. Wadlow, whose nickname was the Giant of Alton, Illinois. Most of us, when we think of giants, think of Jack and the Beanstalk, Game of Thrones, or maybe the Jolly Green Giant, all of whom we imagine to be a lot taller than 10 feet. First Samuel, by the way, never refers to Goliath as a giant. David never even calls him by name, but rather just as that uncircumcised Philistine. But I'm betting that those of you who first heard this story back in Sunday school as kids remember Goliath being called a giant. I'm also sure that you've heard people talk about modern day battles between Davids and Goliaths. Inspiring stories about the little guy going up against corporations or governments or any big powerful organization or person. When a small school defeats a much larger one in sports, we'll often hear comparisons to David and Goliath. We tend to cheer for the underdog. See, the little guy can win against the giants of this world. Too bad all of this entirely misses the point of this well-known story from the Bible. Eight foot nine, by the way. Our Old Testament lectionary reading today is actually only a small part of 1 Samuel's chapter 17. For the sake of time, those who developed the lectionary pared down our reading 
to just the minimum. And even that is long. So, some quick background. The army of the Philistines, who controlled the land hugging the Mediterranean coast, had lined up in a stalemate against the army of Israel, led by King Saul. Every day for weeks, the hulking Goliath would yell across the valley between the two armies, taunting them, challenging King Saul to send out a champion for one-on-one -on -one combat to end the current conflict. Now, one of the reasons that Saul became king in the first place was that he was said to be a head taller than anyone else in Israel, probably about six feet tall. So he was sort of a giant among his own people. But even Saul towered at Goliath's threats. He wasn't about to face Goliath in battle. Last Sunday, if you recall, we were introduced to the young shepherd David, whom, at God's direction, Samuel secretly anointed as Israel's true king. But no one outside the family knew about it, and it apparently didn't change things in Jesse's household back in Bethlehem. As the youngest son, David's place was out in the pastures with the flocks. When rumbles of war turned into actual conflict, Jesse sent his three oldest sons to the front to join Saul's army. This was a volunteer army, provisioned not by the king, but by the families of the soldiers. David is too young to be a soldier, but not too young to regularly transport supplies to his brothers. That's how this shepherd came to be on the front lines the day of the story. David overheard Goliath haranguing Israel's army, and he was shocked and disgusted. How can this Philistine get away with this, David asked. Word of this boy's questioning made its way to Saul himself. So the king sent for him. Now, in the previous chapter of 1 Samuel, David is actually introduced to Saul and plays music to soothe the king, later becoming one of his armor bearers. However, in chapter 17, the writer makes it clear the two have never met before. So now this young, much shorter shepherd boy looks up at the older, much taller king of Israel and without even an introduction blurts out that he will face Goliath if no one else will. It would have been interesting to be a fly on the tent wall watching Saul's reaction to David. The words recorded here, I don't think, does it justice? Saul replies, No, you can't go fight him. You are a boy. He's a giant who has been a warrior since his youth. You are no match for this giant of a man. Go home, boy. Last week, you may recall, we gave you a quiz where we asked who the story of the anointing was really all about. The correct answer was not Samuel, not Saul, or even David, but rather God. The passage was all about God. And guess what? The same is true for our reading today. Sure, David seems to be the star here, but David knows better. You see, David 
was not offended by Goliath taunting the army of Saul or even the army of the Israelite people, but rather the army of the living God, he said. Goliath was guilty of blasphemy against God. Not Saul, not David, but God. This boy seemingly was the only one to understand this. Yes, you could say he bragged to Saul about killing lions and bears, but he acknowledged it. It was God who did the battle, not him. God saved him from the fierce paws of lions and bears. He will do it again now against this Philistine who dares insult the God of Israel. David makes an even stronger claim to that protection by refusing to wear armor or take with him sword, spear, or shield, the usual weapons of war. Why? Because David knows something no one else apparently did. You see, David was not alone. David himself wasn't even the warrior here. Sure, he loaded the sling with a rock and sent it on its way, but it was God who felled Goliath. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, David yells at Goliath. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. It's not about me. It's all about God, David says. Particularly interesting in David's words here is that he didn't say it was God who kills or avenges, but rather that it was the Lord who saves. The Lord saves. Remember in talking about his battles with bears and lions, he didn't say God killed them, but rather that God rescued David from the wild animals. Jesus did not swing a bloody axe at his enemies didn't spill a drop of blood from anyone other than himself. And yet, he saved us. God's business doesn't appear to be fighting our battles for us, but rather rescuing us, saving us. David didn't face Goliath alone. God was there to save him. Christ came into the world to save us. What are the Goliaths in our lives today? Goliaths lurk over us in so many ways. Addictions, poverty, hunger, violence, crime, injustice, pollution, war. For some, these Goliaths are bigger than they are for others, but they are all out there and threaten all of us. And even worse, they are attempts at challenging God, challenging His reign. An attack on God's creation is an attack on God himself. Saul's army sat still and avoided conflict with Goliath. I wonder, were they any less guilty of blasphemy against God than Goliath? Maybe even more so because they were the people of the covenant. They should have known better. What about us? Will we show the courage to tackle the evil giants of today? 
knowing that in the end God will rescue us, actually, He already has through Christ. And that is true peace as we go out facing Goliath. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now turn our hearts and minds to the Lord in prayer. O God, if you build the house, who can destroy it? If you establish a covenant, who can defeat your purpose? If you turn against your people in righteous judgment, who can withstand your anger? Yet you have assembled a people and called them your own. You have set your sign in the heavens that you will never withdraw your blessing. And you have sent Christ as the eternal seal of your love. Nothing can separate us from your redeeming graciousness. We praise your abiding guidance, O God, for you sent us Jesus, our teacher and Messiah, to model for us the way of love for the whole universe. We offer these prayers prayers of love on behalf of ourselves and our neighbors, on behalf of your creation and our fellow creatures. Today, dear Lord, we are particularly mindful of those who are in the way of tropical storms or those who suffer from excessive heat. We pray today our continued prayers for Alan for his comfort, for his children, Victoria, Victor, and Patrick. We also pray for Dallas Harbin. Our prayers continue for Joe, for Barbara Plyler, for Jean, and for Claudette, for Ben, for Buster and Terry, for Nancy and Ashley. Our prayers for Mary and Glenda, for Jerry, for Johnny and Sandy, for Larry, for Stephen, for David and Beverly. Our prayers for Adrian and Emma, for Leanne and Rick. Prayers for Barbara, for Kennedy, Michaela, and Benny. Our prayers as well for Pat Bunton, for Joyce and for Chris, for Gary, for Ellen, for Lee and for Mitchell. We thank you that you call and name us Christ's church. Make us worthy servants in his name. Set us apart so that we can witness to your commandment, your reconciliation, your righteousness, and your peace. Help us to build a society where justice reigns, where the weak are empowered, not exploited. Give us a sense of what is right so that we may face the Goliaths in our lives and do what is in accord with Christ's will. Pour out upon us, O God, the power and wisdom of your Spirit, that we may walk with Christ the way of the cross, ready to offer even the gift of our lives to show forth to the world our hope in your kingdom. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, and who taught us to pray, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, Christians, let us tell the world what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which will appear on your screen. Christians, what do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We close out this service with the hymn, Love Lifted Me. Please join in singing with us.
nothing else could help, love lifted me. God's love takes many forms and shines best when we follow Christ's commands to love one another. We hope you've been lifted today through this service. Please remember to give it a like and share it with others. Also, don't forget to help support this online ministry through your gifts, tithes, and offerings. We'll have information on how to send them on your screen in a few moments. We invite you to join us in person for worship each Sunday at 11 a.m. or right here at noon. Either way, we are thankful for your participation in this opportunity to share the gospel. Hope to see you next Sunday. May the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do God's will, seeking that which is pleasing in God's sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you and give you His peace now and forevermore. Amen.